the Mossbacher Institute, which hosts tonight's event, has been doing these kind of events for almost 10 years now to address the most pressing issues in our country in the areas of trade, economics, and public policy. And for fully half of that time, the last five years, the Institute has been led by Dr. Lori Taylor. Um, Lori has recently picked up a rather significant additional duty as the new head of our Public Service and Administration Department. And so sadly, as of the end of this calendar year, Lori will give up leadership of the Mossbacher uh, Institute and move on to focus on uh, running a department, which is plenty full-time work. Lori, before you get out of here, since this is your last Mossbacher event, would you mind standing and letting us thank you for a superb job over the past five years? Replacing Lori as the director of the Institute is Dr. Raymond Robertson, and we are so blessed to have Raymond on our faculty. He is the holder of the Helen and Roy Review Chair in Economics and Government here at the Bush School. More significantly, he is a great scholar, he's a great teacher, he's a great human being, and he's a great representative of our college of this university. And we are really, really fortunate to have him moving into this job. And we're excited about watching Raymond and the Mossbacher team continue the great work that they've been doing for the last few years under Lori's superb leadership. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Robertson for the, to the stage for the first time as he does his test drive of this beast and introduces our guest speaker for the evening. Raymond. Thank you, uh, General Welsh, for that introduction. It's such an honor to be here at the Bush School and to be stepping into these shoes. Uh, it's really a, a great opportunity for me to, first of all, thank uh, Dean Welsh for that introduction, but also for the leadership and the enthusiasm and the positivity that he brings to the Bush School. It's really uh, had a remarkable impact, and we're just such so honored and proud uh, to have him here. And you said all the nice things about me, but I look up to you, so uh, thank you very much. And I'd also like to especially join uh, everyone in thanking Lori Taylor for the amazing work that she's done. I mean, I feel quite humbled and a little intimidated of stepping into this position uh, after she's done such an amazing, wonderful job. But I know that uh, the staff has been really amazing and supportive, and I'm really honored and delighted to be working uh, with both Cindy and Jennifer as we move forward. And so I'm really excited about this opportunity and hope I can live up to Lori's amazing example. I'm really excited tonight, uh, especially to be introducing uh, Congressman Flores. We've been trying to uh, uh, bring him over as much as possible because we're big fans and we're really honored to have him here tonight. And it's a pleasure for me to tell you a little bit about him. Um, as I'm sure you know, uh, he just got elected to his fifth term. He'll be starting his fifth term. He was first to, all right, last night. Uh, he's been really, really active in Congress and held a number of very important roles. For the 114th Congress, Flores was elected by his fellow conservative colleagues to serve as chair of the Republican Study Committee, uh, the largest caucus of U.S. Congress, an influential group of the House Republicans committed to economic opportunity, national security, fiscal responsibility, American values, and limited government. Additionally, Flores serves on the powerful House Energy and Commerce Committee and the Veterans Affairs Committee, doing very important work for our veterans and all of us citizens. He's a ninth generation Texan, which is pretty impressive. He was raised in Stratford, a small town in the Texas Panhandle, and comes from a long line of ranching family heritage. Through hard work, determination, and prudent savings, he was able to pay his own way through Texas A&M University. He's one of us and uh, graduated in 1976 with a BBA in accounting with, with honor, cum laude. In 1985, he received an MBA from Houston Baptist University and has gone on to hold a number of important governance positions in various public companies as well, private companies and nonprofit organizations. Today, he serves as one of the trustees of the Houston Baptist University, the board of directors of Texas A&M's Private Enterprise Research Center, the advisory board for the Ranching Heritage, Ranching Heritage Association, and the Congressional Board of Directors of the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute. Previous governance positions included the commissioner of the Texas Real Estate Commission, director and past chair of the Association of Former Students of Texas A&M University, as well as serving on several important corporate boards. In 2012, Flores was inducted into the Texas A&M University Corps of Cadets Hall of Honor. In 2010, Texas A&M honored him as a distinguished alumnus, the highest honor bestowed upon a former student of A&M. And in 2003, he was also recognized as an outstanding alumnus of Texas A&M's Mays Business School. We are so honored and delighted 
to welcome a great friend of Texas A&M and of the Bush School. Please join me in welcoming Representative Bill Flores. Thank you very much for such an honor. Well, hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to be back on the campus of Texas A&M and to be here in the, uh, uh, among the fans of the Bush Library, the Mossbacher Institute, and the Bush School. I'm, uh, my wife, Jean, and I are really honored to be here. I want to apologize in advance that I don't get to come here as often as I used to uh, back when I was uh, a person who got to be in the real world. Uh, I, want, I want to thank, uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. I want to also thank uh, General uh, Mark Welch and all of the leadership team at the Mossbacher Institute for inviting me to uh, join you this evening. Uh, a couple of factoids. Um, Mark uh, Welch and I both married babes. And we're classmates. It's just that he's class 76 at the Air Force Academy. I'm class 76 here. I was an Air Force ROTC. He's a four-star general. I went the wrong way, became a Congress critter. So <laughs> let me start with a couple of caveats regarding uh, tonight's discussion. I hope we have a great conversation. I'd like you to, to know that uh, I've only had three or four hours sleep the last couple of nights. As you know, we had some call to the election that came up that was part of it. The second part is I have a kidney stone that, that impacted me starting about 36 hours ago that I'm still fighting. So I took my paid meds at the right moment. So I have just a dull ache instead of a stabbing pain right this minute. Uh, and so the, the note I wrote to myself this morning is never to uh, agree to do a speech after noon uh, following the, the day after an election. Uh, that said, it's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here. It's also a, a, a pleasure to represent Texas A&M University, one of the uh, leading research and educational institutions uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, as a former student of Texas A&M, it's an honor for me to represent what I consider to be an outstanding alma mater. Um, I have attended these discussions in the past, and I'm always uh, uh, thrilled about what I've been able to learn and the horizons that it's opened for me and the additional uh, fidelity of vision it's given to me in the, the discussion areas that are talked about. Now, I, I know Madeline Albright was here last night, and uh, so I, I'm sorry that I missed that. Again, I had something other that I was working on last night. <laughs> um, but that said, I mean, that gives you an idea of the caliber of the uh, speakers that are brought here. Uh, by the Mossbacher Institute. Um, this evening I'm going to touch on two, two subjects, one of which I have a deep understanding of, another which is more something I'm interested in, and uh, uh, the first being, the, the, the latter subject first is trade. I'm going to try to find a way to make trade interesting tonight, and that's going to be a little challenging to do, uh, but we're going to do that. I'm going to try to talk typically the way people talk in trade quantitatively, but then I'm going to try to add some qualitative elements into the discussion as well. Uh, the second thing is going to talk, I'm going to talk about an area, an area of, of uh, my expertise and passion, that's energy, and uh, try to keep it all interesting. In the 1983 State of the Union address that Ronald Reagan delivered, one of his sentences said this. He said, as a leader of the West and as a country that has become great and rich because of economic freedom, America must be an unrelenting advocate of free trade. Now the question is, what's free trade? Because we hear a lot about free, what about having free and fair trade, but sometimes people don't really do a very good job of expressing what that is. I'll tell you, it's really simple. And uh, the, the president and I share this definition, no subsidies, <clears throat> no barriers, and no, uh, no tariffs anywhere by anybody at any time for any product. Um, trade is a part of what we, how we do commerce as Americans. Uh, the freedom of trade is one of our greatest economic opportunities in this country, and we're able to compete because of the way we do things in the United States, we're able to compete anywhere in the world uh, with as little government interference as possible. The U.S. is the world's largest economy. We're the world's largest exporter and the world's largest importer of goods and services. Trade's critical to our promise, our prosperity, and our security. It fuels our economic growth, it supports job creation, it creates job opportunities, and it helps hardworking Americans provide for their family with, and to have access to affordable goods and services. In Congress, there are several of us, although I'd say the number is shrinking, they're fighting for strong protections of intellectual property, increased market access, and stopping restrictive barriers to trade. 
Now, while I may not always see eye to eye with the president on the tactics he's using with respect to the trade discussions we're having with our partners around the world, I have to uh, admit that he is having some meaningful results, and I'll go through several of those in a minute. Uh, let me give you a couple of them in the meantime. Uh, he and his administration have successfully renegotiated our trade agreement with South Korea. They've opened or reopened numerous new markets for U.S. agricultural products. Uh, we're making progress with the Europeans and we're engaging in new trade talks with the Japanese. The latest uh, U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement looks promising. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. One other thing you may not realize, when the president uh, threatened to slap tariffs on steel and aluminum, suddenly we've had over 20 announcements of new steel making capacity and new aluminum uh, smelting capacity in this country. You don't hear about that, but those are the things that are happening. Billions of dollars of investment commitments are being made right now to build, rebuild those industries in the United States today. One of the things, uh, the Trump, let me say this, the Trump administration has made reforming our trade policy a priority. Um, the uh, present trading system exists under outdated rules that were created for a different economic era. Now, speaking of economic eras, I got to attend a speech. I was at a chamber banquet uh, for the Bryan College Station Chamber on Monday night, and uh, Dr. Uh, excuse me, President Michael Young was our featured speaker that night. And he talked about something that really sort of opened my eyes to, to think about things in a different way. Our chamber here locally is 100 years old this year. And so uh, President Young started talking about where we were as an economy back in 1918. You know, we were just uh, right about the conclusion. Actually, Sunday represents the conclusion, the 100th anniversary of the conclusion of World War I with the signing of the armistice in Europe. Anyway, his uh, speech uh, talked about where things were in 1918 and where they are 100 years later. In 1918, the United States economy represented 24.5% of the world's GDP today. Excuse me, then. It does today. And it's pretty well maintained that same metric for the intervening years, even though the country transitioned through several economic phrases, uh, phases from agrarian to industrial, uh, to a uh, service-based economy, to a technology-based economy, and so forth. And we're the only country in the history of the world to have ever generated that long-lived history of economic results. Now, one of the reasons that President Young mentioned for that performance was the impact of federal investment in basic research, primarily based on partnering with research and educational institutions like Texas A&M University. And I think all of us can, in this audience can agree um, with that, that premise. And I, I tell you, I'm certainly thrilled to have served as a member of Congress during a time period when uh, basic federal uh, research for basic, excuse me, funding for basic research here at Texas A&M has expanded dramatically uh, over the course of the last eight years. Now, so there's also another reason for the U.S. consistent leadership in the world economy, and that's because we've long supported fair trade policies. Now, we had a hiccup in the 20s and 30s. I think several of you that are uh, students of history, of economic history, uh, re recall Smoot Hawley when we decided to adopt some ill fated uh, protectionist uh, policies toward trade. And they hurt us, they hurt the, they hurt the uh, world economy everywhere. Uh, but except for that, uh, we have uh, believed in free and fair trade in this country, and we believe that it lifts all boats from the richest countries to the poorest countries and helps create um, opportunities and incomes uh, for hardworking families everywhere in the world. The U.S. is the least protectionist of all the major countries, but we have the trade deficits to show for it today. China and Europe are highly protectionist, and their trade imbalances with us uh, reflect that protectionism. So let me, uh, currently the U.S. trade deficit's the largest in the world. Last year, the trade deficit in goods and services was about $568 billion. The trade deficit with China was about, two th was about three quarters of that, $375 billion. Our exports to China are just under $200 billion. Our imports from them are over $500 billion. Now, the president has been trying to deal with the Chinese to get them to come uh, reform 
our trading agreements with them. Uh, and they, they have not, uh, let's say they weren't willing partners initially, so he slapped uh, tariffs on $200 billion worth of imports that are 10% now, raising to 25% on January the 1st. Uh, China retaliated by slapping tariffs on, of, on $60 billion of products, exports from the U.S. to China. Now, one of the interesting things that people haven't thought about is that we have the ability, if we wanted to, to slap tariffs on another $200 plus billion of exports to uh, uh, of, uh, Chinese imports. Now, what would the impact be if we got into an all-out trade war with China? If we fully tariffed everything that we import from them, and if they fully tariffed everything that they import from us, the impact on their economy is about is a decrease of about 5% of GDP. Conversely, with us, it's a, about a half a percent decline in GDP. So everybody loses, but they lose a lot worse. Now, that's the reason, because the fact that it's 10 times worse for them than it is for us, that they've suddenly decided that they'd like to sit down and have a conversation with us. One of the biggest challenges we have is the Chinese policy of, of uh, state-sponsored policy of stealing our intellectual property and also um, the forced expropriation of U.S. intellectual property uh, to their state-owned uh, companies. Now, so let's transition from China to Europe for a minute. Uh, the trade deficit in goods with the European Union was about $151 billion. Now, one of the things that's interesting here is there is a trade deficit between the EU and China, which is about uh, $201 billion or 176 billion euro. So, the, the, you know, the, what that, in other words, the EU is being significantly hurt by Chinese unfair trade policies. Now, when the president first started to engage with the EU in terms of trying to reset our trade relationship, the Europeans initially balked, and you heard about some of the nasty things they said about the U.S. and our policy when it came to trade. But he finally got their attention, and he basically said, look, they're cheating you as bad as they're cheating us. Why don't we work together as the world's leading economies to force China to come to the table? That got China's attention, and that's the reason we're having some back-channel conversations, which I think are ultimately going to be fruitful. Uh, the, again, the biggest challenge is can we stop the theft of IP or the forced uh, theft of IP? Uh, the trade deficit with goods with Japan was $69 billion, and the trade deficit in goods with uh, Mexico and Canada, our NAFTA partners, was $90 billion. Now, we all, I think, in this room can agree it's unfair for one nation to have to uh, bear over a half a trillion dollars worth of trade imbalances just because we play by a set of rules that was designed uh, for an era long ago when, with a different economy. And so those of us that are free traders in Congress are working with the president to try to encourage free and fair trade practices. When we get into the Q&A in a minute and we have a conversation with Laurie, I'll talk a little bit about what's happening in Congress with respect to trade because I am a little bit concerned about the direction we could go there, and, and we'll go through that in a minute. Uh, just as an FYI, since we're all here in Texas, it's a, you know, you can't have a conversation about trade and not talk about Texas. We're the number one exporting state in this country. We're responsible for almost 20% of U.S. exports. Trade is a big deal here in Texas. Uh, exports from Texas help contribute to the $2.3 trillion of U.S. goods and services that were exported in 2017. And Texas exports to the U.S. Free Trade Agreement partners totaled $157 billion in 2017. Now, we do have a new trade agreement with Mexico uh, and Canada. I thought the uh, president's, I got to sort of get an inside view about how the president dealt with Canada because Canada was initially balking. Uh, he has a really interesting negotiating style, but it did work. Uh, Trudeau finally came to the... I used to, he just basically picks up a big stick and beats them until they're ready to talk. <laughs> I guess the camera was on for that part too, wasn't it? <laughs> In any event, it's not the way I would do it as a business person, but you've got to admit that it is working. It does cause some consternation among um, our trading partners. One of the things the president did, a little inside baseball that you may not realize, one of the things the, 
that the, one of the actions that the president took that caused everybody in the world to sit up and take notice about the fact that the United States government means business when it comes to our relationships with foreign countries is when he said that we were moving the, our consulate, our uh, embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. The rest of the world said, whoa. He did what the U.S. law said we were going to do over 20 years ago. So he means business. Now, like it or not, I mean, he does mean business, and he has decided that he's going to start trying to right some of these things, including trade. And that's what's happened with uh, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. I'll give you a few things, and I'm not going to go chapter by chapter, but I'll tell you a few things that are in, that, in the agreement. Uh, the new agreement includes a new labor cha chapter that brings labor obligations into the core of the agreement and also makes them fully enforceable. The chapter represents the strongest labor provisions of any trade agreement. Now, most people think of uh, Republicans as being anti-trade, I mean, excuse me, anti-labor, but if you think about what he's done, he's, he's, he's got fully, he's got very strong labor protections in that. Uh, it creates a more level playing field. It requires the parties to adopt and maintain in law and practice labor rights as recognized by the International Labor Organization. Also, an annex on worker uh, representation and collective bargaining in Mexico is included, and new provisions to take measures to prohibit the importation of goods produced by forced labor and to, and to address violence against workers exercising their labor rights. So that doesn't sound Republican, but it's in there. So just wanted to let you know. I mean, I want, I want to open everybody's eyes as to the way uh, this president deals with things. It also benefits American farmers, ranchers, and agribusinesses. Uh, U.S. agriculture has generally done pretty well under NAFTA 1.0, under the but there was a, there were problems with Canada. Canada wouldn't let our dairy products in, um, and they also wouldn't let our poultry pro our our primarily eggs in, um, and that was the reason they they balked at signing. And the president basically went to him and said, "Okay, how many cars do you export to the United States every year?" And Trudeau said about four million cars. The president said, "Okay, well, I'm going to make you a deal. I'm going to slap only going to slap a 20 percent tariff on them instead of the 25 percent tariff that we slapped on uh, Chinese cars coming or Chinese products coming to the U.S." Trudeau signed the agreement. So uh, we've got expanded access for American food and agricultural products. Uh, we also have uh, modernized the agricultural chapters of the agreement. We've got a whole new chapter on digital trade because digital trade wasn't a big deal when NAFTA 1.0 was uh, negotiated and signed, and we also are creating enforceable environmental obligations for all three parties to the agreement. That doesn't sound very Republican, does it? But it, that's what he did. That's good. So uh, anyway, that, that's a little bit about the USMCA. Uh, one of the things I promised that we'd talk about when we started this conversation is the impact of some of these. I want to talk about the markets that have been opened. Uh, the president and the administration are trying to level the trading field with, uh, with our partners. And here are some of the things that have happened. Uh, we are exporting U.S. poultry to Morocco for the first time. We can now export U.S. sheep and goats to Japan for the first time since 2004. We can export U.S. pork to Argentina for the first time since 1992. We can export U.S. poultry to Korea for the first time for 2014. And I've got another five, six items. But you all get the drift of where we are when it comes to trade. Again, different, different uh, negotiating style, but it's, it's actually working. Um, well, we're talking about trade. One of the areas uh, that the president did, I thought, was really um, ill-advised, was to slap uh, tariffs on newsprint. We only produce 20% of the newsprint that we consume in this country, and the, the the printed news business is already suffering because of changes in the way that we as consumers get our news. And so he basically, uh, because uh, this ill-advised policy was basically accelerating the decline of the newsprint business. Now, there are certain newspapers, I don't care if that happens or not, <laughs> but there are some right here at home that I do care. And so fortunately, uh, our, our, our smaller local papers made me aware of this. And I, uh, you know, I got to think, you know, this is not the way to deal with something we don't produce here is to slap a tariff on it. We don't produce it here. Uh, so I think tariffs ought to be on things where there's a where there's an imbalance in the market and the other side is subsidizing or putting up barriers to us being able to trade with them or they're dump subsidizing uh, their exports into our country. 
And so uh, I went and testified in front of the International Trade Commission, the ITC, uh, in April. And fortunately, in August, the International Trade Commission voted five to zero to terminate the duties on newsprint. So I uh, just want to let you know, when it, when it comes to free trade, I'm a free, trade all, free trader all the way around, and so I, I tried to help with that. Let's transition to energy for a minute. Again, going back to one of my favorite presidents, um, Ronald Reagan made a statement on uh, World Environment Day in 1986, and, I say, and he said this, quote, a superior natural resources policy is one that favors those institutions by which resources are new resources are substituted for old ones, individual enterprise guided by the price signals of the market, and technological advances that conserve resources and permit them to use, be, be used more efficiently. He also said that the best answer, while conservation is worthy in itself, is to try to make us independent of outside sources to the greatest extent possible for our energy. Now, you remember what was happening in 1986. Some of you weren't born then, but we were a huge importer. We were highly dependent on forward sources of energy. Think about where we are today. The world has turned on its head because of the policies that we've enacted when it comes to energy. So if you think about energy, what does it take to have a successful economy? You have to have inputs. You've got to have labor. You've got to have capital. You need to have technology. You need to have innovation. You need to have education. You also need to have energy. That's one of the successful inputs. Without attractively priced, affordable, sustainable energy, you don't have an economy that can be robust and, and live up to its full potential. We're now the world's number one producer of oil and natural gas. And this, this change and, and to where we are today happened right here in Texas with, by a fight in Texas that was started by a fight in Texas Aggie who was curious as to whether or not you could get hydrocarbons from shale, essentially something as hard as this, this uh, this particle word here, I guess. <laughs> in any event, uh, he invested tens of millions of dollars in new ways to use hydraulic fracturing and long offset horizontal drilling, and suddenly we're able to get oil and gas from sources we never dreamed possible when I started the energy business 30 years ago. Uh, and now it's, it's that, that theory, of, of that, that curiosity that George Mitchell had has really changed the, the uh, the country for the better and change the world for the better. Um, now, I focus my policy work in Washington on trying to find the next George Mitchells or the people that are developing new technology, but not only in traditional sources of energy, but also in renewables and in particularly my passion, and that's next generation nuclear. Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm passionate about next generation nuclear is if you really want to have a zero carbon emissions world, the best way to do it is to go nuclear because it's always on and there's zero emissions. You can't get that from other traditional renewables today. Now, what has been the impact of what George Mitchell did uh, to, in terms of the impact on natural gas business? When you look at global CO2 emissions from energy in 2017, they grew by 1.6% and 426 metric tons again in 2017. Conversely, the U.S. led the, the uh, world in CO2 emission declines by about a half a percent and 42 million tons. That's the ninth time in the last 18 years that we've led the global emissions decline. Now, these declines, uh, well, I'll come back to that in a minute. We also had our third consecutive yearly decline in emissions, and U.S. carbon emissions are at the lowest level since 1992. The largest increase, on the other hand, uh, came from China, an increase of 1.6 and 119 million tons. The next highest came from India, where emissions rose by 4.4 percent and 93 million tons. You also hear the EU beating its chest about how it wants to promote the Paris Accord and it's going to change its carbon emissions picture. Its emissions actually went up in 2017 and a half for several years, they were up 1.5% and 42 million tons. In other words, they, everything that we reduced, they offset by increasing. And so that I think is um, something we need to be aware of. And what caused our emissions to go down? 
some government policy, but mostly it's because George Mitchell found a way to produce natural gas more sustainably and to use that clean fuel uh, to produce it at such a low price that it made coal unattractively priced. And so you reduce the amount of coal usage and you increase the amount of natural gas usage. I think we ought to use that example uh, when it comes to advanced to next generation nuclear to try to go to the next step to find new ways to reduce emissions moving forward. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, advertise a little bit about what my activities have been in Congress on, on, uh, on the energy front. Um, one of the things I was really pleased to be a, have a participant in is to work with Joe Barton, another fellow fighting Texas Aggie Congress critter. And uh, he and I worked to get the uh, oil export ban lifted. Back in the uh, 70s when we had, uh, when, when uh, OPEC was embargoing oil to the United States and we had a huge run up in oil prices, we went through two or three oil price shocks, uh, we decided we, we as a country were not going to export oil anymore. We're in a totally different world today uh, from our energy picture, and so we thought it was inappropriate to continue that ban. Uh, we worked collectively. We uh, worked with both sides of the aisle, and we actually got uh, President Obama to agree and put this provision into a funding bill, and we're able to lift that ban. And the United States is now among the largest exporters of oil and natural gas in the world. And what does that do to us? Well. If you think about some of our challenges uh, around the world, it's put us in a position to be geopolitically, or in a, it gives us an ability to be much more strategic in our geopolitical posturing. So if you look at Russia, Russia is having a harder time because they've got competition for stable energy uh, resources coming from us for our European allies and our, our Asian allies that weren't available to those allies before. And so Russia's currency uh, has been coming down. Uh, they, they've had a collapse in their, their uh, currency trading, uh, their currency uh, exchange rates. Uh, their economy is suffering a little bit because we've given an alternative to folks that don't want to be uh, trapped into uh, becoming dependent on Russian energy. Also, it's given us an ability by, um, in, by putting sanctions on Iran to be able to change the activity of Iran. The, Iran's uh, capital inflows uh, that they were turning around and using to export terrorism around the world. So it's really changed a lot of things. Of course, it's been good for our balance of payments. It's been good for uh, U.S. jobs. Uh, but in terms of a geopolitical strategy, it's been huge for us in terms of what we've been able to do. Uh, it's also given new markets uh, to our, our newfound position as the number one producer of oil and natural gas. Uh, give you some examples of, of what's happened there. Our crude oil production is averaging 10.9 million barrels per day now. Where it was, and you compare it to 10 years ago, double where we were 10 years ago. If you look at our imports uh, today, they're about 5.8 million barrels a day. That's a cut by about 40% from where we, are, where we were uh, 10 years ago. Uh, natural gas production today is 90 billion cubic feet per day. That's up from 58 billion cubic feet per day in 2008. Natural gas imports in 20, uh, 2018 are 8 billion cubic feet per day, um, but they were uh, 11 billion cubic feet per day in 2008. So you can see what it's done uh, to us in terms of growing our own fuel, becoming less dependent, becoming more independent economically. Uh, the second activity I've been involved with is advanced nuclear. Uh, even though I'm an oil and gas guy by uh, career, I am uh, passionate about trying to do things to find, uh, to, to provide the energy to have a sustainable economy and do it with a reduced emissions footprint. Uh, we're not going to build any more current generation nuclear power plants. They're big, they're expensive, uh, and they're, they tend to be remote from where the demand is or they tend to be in areas where if they want to be close to where the demand is, they have to be in areas that are environmentally more uh, susceptible to earthquakes, floods, you just, things like that. Um, if you really want to have distributed power generation, we need to look at small modular reactors. We need to look at, advanced, at next generation nuclear reactors. Now, the challenge is we have as a country is that we are leading in the research area, but we don't produce the fuel for those. You know, if you're going to produce a high-performance car, you've got to have high-performance fuel for it. So 
Uh, what I've been working on, and we had a bill that came out of my committee and it should go to the House floor during the lame duck session, is, uh, is high assay uh, enriched fuel, uh, for uranium fuel for, to power that next generation of reactors. And I'm pretty excited about the standard there. Uh, the next area I'm working on is, come, is the renewable fuel standard. The renewable fuel standard was first passed in 2005. It was modified again in 2007. Uh, in typical congressional fashion, they forgot about the rules of economics, supply and demand, things like that. You know, who, who thinks about that? Uh, and so it, it set up a standard that could not be met by uh, the economy. The economy can't absorb uh, the, the conventional uh, renewable fuel source, think corn ethanol, uh, that, the, that the RFS requires, the renewable fuel standard requires. And so we've been trying to find a way to deal with this. Now, this is a passionate issue because it pits uh, Democrat versus Democrat, Republican versus Democrat. It's not so much uh, party versus party. It's uh, corn states versus non-corn states and uh, corn, corn interest versus non-corn interest. And so what I've been trying to do is thread a needle where we can provide some way uh, to let the corn folks feel like they've got a market for their fuel at the same time develop the, the real fuels that the renewable fuel standard was intended to, to, uh, to promote, and that's advanced uh, uh, biofuels. Now, the, uh, one of the challenges that, one of the things that's brought the corn folks to the table is that the, the renewable fuel standard for corn expire, or conventional re renewable fuel as it's called, expires in 2022, and after that, they don't know which, the EPA is go which way the EPA is gonna go. You don't know, you know who's gonna be in power. Is it gonna be a, a Democrat? Is it gonna be a Republican? Which way will they go? And you don't know, and it could change year to year. Uh, so that's brought them to the table. The other thing is the environmental community really doesn't like corn-based ethanol very much today. And so they realize they're under pressure from the environmental community. They've got this regulatory uncertainty out there, and so they're talking to us today. Uh, the, so the goal is, in, in our conversation, we've had a, we had a series of roundtables. We dealt with everybody, every conceivable interest group, starting with a consumer. Because if you don't get it right for the consumer, you haven't gotten it right. And so we have, we have been working with the consumer community, the environmental community, the corn community, the advanced biofuel industry, the downstream energy refiners, the transporters, the marketers, and if you think about where all that fuel is used, it's used by vehicles. So we've been dealing with the manufacturers of vehicles. And we've come up with a solution. I'm not gonna drill into the details here, but basically uh, we're gonna say that next, in order to meet fuel economy standards uh, that car manufacturers have to meet, they need a new fuel supply. The way to get that is with higher octane. The way to get higher octane is use ethanol. That's the cheapest, most environmentally friendly way to get higher octane. The challenge I have is that if you look at the octane on your fuel pump, you see an 87 and an 89 and a 91, and we're proposing a 95 fuel octane standard. And so everybody's gonna say, well, if you look at the price differential, how it jumps up, this is gonna be really high priced. It's really not because if you look at what 89 is, 89 is really 91, and 91 today is really 95. It's just the de how you define it. So we've, we've got to fix that, that communications area. The other thing too is if you look at the margin on the, the, the refiners and the marketers make a lot more money per gallon on the 91 octane today because it's a niche fuel. They only about one out of every eight gallons is that versus uh, regular uh, unleaded gasoline. So we've got to try to find a way to deal with that. Um, and I've, I've got a solution I'm not gonna share it with you just yet, but I do have a way to do it. So those are the things, so we, we got, I've got, we've got an education process we've got to go, and it's gonna be all hands on deck for that. It's gonna to have to be the car manufacturers talking about how a 95 octane fuel gives you a lower cost per mile and it optimizes the cost of your vehicle in order to meet these higher fuel economy standards moving forward. And so we're gonna, they're gonna have to be all in. The refiners are gonna have to be all in because they've gotta find a way to meet that new uh, standard using ethanol. Um, and we've got to convince the consumers that it's really in their best interest because when you get in your car and drive it, you don't know the cost per mile. When you fill your tank, you know the cost per gallon. And so if you're getting more miles per gallon, you don't see that, you just see that it costs more per gallon. But when you're really saving money because you're using a more efficient a vehicle and more efficient cars. That's what I'm trying to grapple with right now. 
So I'm going to wrap up, and I think Laurie and I are going to have a conversation. The things we're going to be talking about is, uh, what is this new Congress? You know, Congress changed its, its complexion, and when we swore in the new Congress uh, in January, uh, what does that mean for trade, and what does it mean for energy? And so I'm looking forward to that conversation, and thanks. Are you ready? And I, you know, I'm happy to rep represent Texas A&M, so I've been doing Gigam a long time. I also represent Baylor, so I've learned how to do Sikkim. <laughs> and then <laughs> my, my, my main babe down here said don't do it, but I also represent part of the UT footprint. And so I've had to learn how to do that other M2. So. Oh my. Yeah. But, you know how to rile up a crowd. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Actually, you know, even though UT is represented theoretically by six Congress people, I'm their go-to guy. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. It's just crazy. So, so they, know, they know you're going to get things done. But I guess the real question is, it, it would appear that the Speaker of the House is going to be a Democrat. <clears throat> That's correct. And that will change some of the paths and processes <clears throat> by which you can get things done. Mm -hmm. Coming out of the minority, what will you have to do differently to be able to implement these ideas you were telling us about? Can I ask a poll question real quick? Sure. Okay. How many of y'all think uh, Washington, D.C. is a dysfunctional circus? Show of hands. That's kind of what I expected. Well, let, me, let me talk about the real world up there. I mean, it is still swampy, and some people get up there and think it's a hot tub. But we passed 278 bills in this Congress, which started in January of 2017. And the President signed all 278. I mean, we, we in the House passed well over 1,000, but 750 of them got jammed up over in that other body in the North. And of that 278 bills that the President signed, 98.9% .9 of them were bipartisan. Did you know that? Do you have any idea of that? You only hear about the 1.1% that are non-bipartisan. You don't hear about the things we did. And so we did great things on opi opioids. We did great things on mental health. We did great, great things on school safety. We did great things in terms of trying to uh, uh, deal with uh, the, the, the instant background check system for gun purchases. We did all these things. You never heard anything about that. And so the reason I give you that is the preamble is mm -hmm. that if that's the way we led Congress when we, now that we're in the majority. When we move to the minority, if the other side will use that same um, strategy, I think we can have some good success. Um, that is something that I won't have much control over, but mm -hmm. it is something where I'm, I'm hoping that the other, side said, the other side will say, okay, we were victorious. And we realize the big issues that people are talking about are border security and immigration and health care and getting arms around the deficits. And so hopefully we'll be able to work together to address those. And a lot of them will come, you know, come out bipartisan. I am blessed because I work on two of the most bipartisan committees mm -hmm. in Congress, Energy and Commerce. We've had over 100 bills go to the House floor, and 98% of those were passed on a bipartisan basis. All of, almost all of them came out of committee on a bipartisan basis. On a bipartisan basis. And I think that we've got a real opportunity there. Veterans Affairs Committee, almost everything that comes out of that committee is on a bipartisan basis as well. So I know it's, a, it's kind of a, it, that answer is there's a way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, will it happen? I hope so. Okay. I, I can't answer it definitively. All it right. is Washington after all. So. <laughs> So in your remarks, you kind of hinted that you have some concerns about the direction trade could go under the new Congress. You want to kind of tell us what you meant? Yes, I, I, uh, I, I sense a movement. Uh, to, I sense two things. One is that 
you have fewer and fewer people as elected policymakers that understand the value of free and fair trade. First of all, they don't understand what, what that definition of free and fair trade that we all talked about a few minutes ago. They don't understand it and they don't appreciate it what it they don't appreciate it what it does for American workers and the opportunity it gives to American consumers where the world becomes optimized. We produce things around the world at the best at the lowest possible cost and it gives economy a chance to move to a high value added or a low value added concept based on the characteristics of the country. We have a lot of people who just don't understand that. The unfortunate thing is it's a that's become bipartisan. So I have people on my side of the aisle that have begun to adopt this populist strategy that uh, we're going to uh, we're going to put America first when it comes to trade and tariff everything. That would be bad for everybody. It would be bad for the world. Uh, I, and uh, the, so that's the first thing. As I, I see fewer and fewer Republicans willing to support free or, free trade, and there's always been a limitation on the number of Democrats that would support free trade. I'll give you a great example. When we were negotiating the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, when we were trying to give President Obama authority to use fast-track trade authority to negotiate uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, with a, a, a group of Asian countries, Asian and Latin American countries, um, he could find very little Democratic support. And mm -hmm. he, was, he was relying on Republicans to carry the water for him. And then when we did, then the next thing you know is some of our own party started calling it Obama trade. And so that was kind of a toxic mixture. Mm -hmm. So I do worry about what's happening on both sides of the aisle in terms of understanding the value of trade and what that means for us moving forward. The second thing that, that, um, that, that kind of is in the back of my head is I think in, I, th I think the president is really more of a protectionist type of person mm -hmm. than he lets on. I think if he was left to all his own devices, now I'm not being critical. I'm just, just this is Bill Flores talking as a as a citizen, not as your congressman. Um, I worry that um, he would, t if given the choice, he would choose protectionism over free trade. I think the reason he doesn't do that is because uh, the people that elected him believe in free trade. And mm -hmm. so I, th that presents an area of potential challenge for us. That said, everything he's been doing has been designed to open up markets both ways. So uh, I've, I've got some optimism uh, that we're going to get this right, again, with a couple of uh, nagging bothers in the back of my head. Okay, so, so there's been some protectionist rhetoric right. towards the objective of freer trade. Right. Protectionist so, rhetoric is the stick that's used mm -hmm. to beat people to come to the table, and then we cut some pretty good deals with them. And, and you, you figure, is there a problem with the ends justifying the means here? No, I, I'm, look, again, it's not the way I would do it. Um, but I do think that the president is a traitor, and he's, he's had some success with this. Mm -hmm. I'm just hoping the next Congress will appreciate that, uh, that, that what the results are and that, that, that we'll have a free trade focused Congress. I, I can't, I don't know what, if it's going to be a free trade Congress or not. Mm -hmm. I hope that it will be. Okay. Do you think that the, the shift away from a free trade Congress or the concern you have about the shift away reflects the general electorate also shifting away from a belief in free trade? I do. I think that um, Americans have been hurt by the way we have let free, free trade operate. When we have become, we have agreed to become the world's biggest importer, uh, but, and we let everybody else restrict our ability to export, either through tariffs or barriers, or the use of subsidies to dump imports into this country. That has hurt us, and that's hurt American workers. And because that's hurt American workers, the, uh, that has caused people to say, well, free trade is bad, because free trade, and the reason they think it's bad is because free trade has not really been free trade. And so that's the reason I'm trying to re-educate people mm -hmm. on what free trade really is, and that is no tariffs, no barriers, no subsidies. If we can do that and talk about the examples, mm -hmm. uh, then I think we can get there. Okay. Uh, but it, it's going to take some work. Yeah, there, there, there seem to be some folks who don't get the idea that tariffs are, are a form of tax. Right, right. The, 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 the terminology really right. seems to matter here. I mean, one of the challenges we're going to have, if you tariff everything come from China, your prices of Walmart are going to go way up. 
Yep. So does that make sense? So. Oh, totally. Yeah. So what, if anything, surprised you about yesterday? Well, <laughs> let's, uh, let's start with Texas. I, uh, one of the margins that we had on our, on our uh, except for Greg Abbott, the Governor Abbott, the margins of victory uh, for Republicans were pretty thin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, think I, I think I know what happened is, and that is the race that, the, if you all remember what the ballot was like, the, t the U.S. Senate race was the top one on there. And so if, if you have a, a voter population that's going in and they see that race on top and they've already been influenced to vote one way or the other, there's a good chance they're gonna vote that way all the way down. And except for Governor Abbott, that kind of happened. And so typically people that would get, uh, you know, 60% of Republican that would get a 60% margin got a 50. And some of these were really thin, 50.3, 50.4, 50.6. I felt like a rock star getting a 57. I'm used to putting up 60 pluses. So anyway, mm -hmm. but uh, that, that was something. But I think it was unique to the Senate race here that caused that. And mm -hmm. then the other thing is, is that um, some people put, I th and I don't anybody take offense to this, but I think some people put more value on disliking the president's um, behavior, his, mm -hmm. his Twitter policy and his statements and uh, versus the impact of what the policies have been. So if you look at ne America's never been stronger, more prosperous, more secure than we are, to are today, but because he has a, um, an interesting style in delivering those policies, I think it caused some consternation and people voted against those policies without really considering the impact on what it means uh, against this style without considering the impact on the policies. In some ways, they were voting against their self-interest mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to safety and security and prosperity of the country. So, probably so, made some of you mad on that one, but. So this is the question uh, from the audience. Um, so this person had read the, about your support of nuclear wind and solar mm -hmm. initiatives, and it was very complimentary, but how do you think we should go about convincing all Republicans that alternative energy is necessary for a sustainable future? Oh man, that's a hard one. I look. Let me say this at the outset: I don't have an answer for every question, so, <laughs> so I'm not going to sit here and try to BS you. Um, one of the the um, what I have to do, I think, as uh, somebody who's leaning in on this issue, is to try to educate uh, my Republican colleagues in terms, and my Democratic colleagues as well, because uh, some of my Democratic colleagues think that if it's not wind or not s solar generator, it's not electric car, that it's gotta be dirty. Um, and that's not necessarily true. Uh, they try to say that has no environmental impact, but it does have an environmental impact. On the other hand, I've got um, Republicans that think automatically if it's wind or solar, it's got to be bad. And you, you, you have to try to educate everybody mm -hmm. on, on that. And so I've, I'm sort of trying to stay out of that argument and say, we're, let's go past wind and solar and go to where we really, the, the really sort of the moonshot approach when it comes to, to zero emissions, and that's advanced nuclear. Mm -hmm. Because that's where you get baseload power and you get it with zero emissions. Uh, with nuclear, you can't do that um, with wind and solar. And if you do do it with wind and solar, you got to have uh, storage. And if you think about what kind of storage it takes to have industrial grade storage, you're talking about trillions of tons of lithium batteries, and lithium is bad for the environment. So think about that. So that's the, the challenge we face uh, and trying to educate people. I, so I'm, I'm trying to just say, hey, let's, let's go past all that wind and solar stuff. Now let, let me tell you about my personal situation here so you don't think I'm just an oil and gas schmuck. Um, I'm the, Gene and I are the largest residential producers of solar generated electricity in Brazos County. I commissioned this system about 10 years ago uh, because I'm kind of a geek and I can afford it. And it produces about 40% of our annual 
electricity usage. Uh, the way we designed our house is it is very efficient, and so my carbon emissions per square foot, if you were, if you will, are probably in the lowest one percent in the country. Uh, and I just did it because, again, I'm a geek and I can afford it. But I know how much it costs. I don't want to impose that on the rest of the United States economy. I want the market to try to get us there. You know, I converted the last mm -hmm. of our light bulbs to LED two weekends ago. So, <laughs> you know, and again, I just did it because, you know, it's, I, it's, I think it's the right thing to do, but I don't want to tell you to do it. You know, I want, I want to be sort of the leading buyer, leading consumer that helps drive those costs down, you know, by being sort of the advanced, the, the lean-in purchaser, it, it creates the volume so that everybody else can buy those things at a cheaper cost ultimately. But I want to go to nuclear. The environmental community gets it as well. If you want to look at a great uh, documentary on nuclear uh, versus all the other forms of uh, low, uh, low carbon energy out there, there's a, a, uh, uh, a documentary called Pandora's Promise. You can get it on iTunes. It's 45 minutes. It's really good. Uh, it's uh, produced by a nuclear engineer. I mean, it's uh, partially funded by a nuclear engineer from here. They graduated from here at Texas A&M who's in the venture capital business on the West Coast, and it's also supported by the environmental community. If you think about it, if you take one nuclear power plant, if you replace it with all solar panels, it takes thousands and thousands of acres. There's the impact on the environment when you do that. Think about what got covered up from the sun down below. Uh, so that, that's what we as policymakers need to be thinking about. So where does coal figure into all of this? Coal is... Uh, Coal is our most abundant resource. I mean, we talk about what's happened in oil and gas. We talk about where we want to go with nuclear. Coal is, because it's abundant and it is, um, rel in certain environments, it's relatively cost effective. Mm -hmm. The challenge is it's very expensive to burn uh, on a clean basis. And so that's where I think the federal government can step in and try to invest in basic research to find a way to burn coal cleanly. Uh, it, it is a carbon-based fuel, but I think there's a way to do that. Uh, there are certain things that coal can be used for on a clean basis in terms of producing steel and things like that. We've got to find a way to do that so that we, we, we lengthen uh, the uh, portfolio we have of energy resources for the longest num most number of generations that we can. Okay. This time last year, uh, Secretary Perry was advocating for uh, policy initiatives to avoid the premature retirement of coal-fired electric plants. Was that something that you supported? Well, he, what he was he was actually uh, trying to promote two uh, things. One, he was mm -hmm. just trying to protect uh, nuclear power plants and coal power plants. And you're going to make me publicly say this? Mm -hmm. I didn't support it. No. Uh, the reason is, look, I'm a free market person, and if we do anything that's not free market, then the cost for all of you goes up, and the, the optimization for your economic opportunity is reduced. And so by trying to come up with a way to protect coal and protect current generation nuclear, not next generation nuclear, we actually make the economy less efficient. And I, I just don't like doing things like that. And so fortunately, I didn't have to make any public statements until today. Uh, <laughs> but the but fortunately, yesterday. But fortunately, the Federal uh, uh, Energy Regulatory Commission put the kibosh on that. Um, that said, that's the reason I think, let's lean into this. Let's go past current generation nuclear, go to next generation nuclear, and let's lean into finding ways to burn coal cleanly. If you could get the emissions profile of coal down to natural gas or better, We've got a fuel source that could last a thousand years uh, on, a, on a much more environmentally friendly basis. And that, that's what we need to do, Wonderful. not try to protect uh, current uh, generations. One of the things I want you to think about, and a lot of people think that you know, wind and solar are the way to go. Just for every megawatt of wind or solar that you have today, and Texas is the leading, generation, leading wind generation, generator in the country, and we're like number five or number six in the world. The challenge with that is for every megawatt of that renewable power source, because it's not uh, baseload, it's not, it's an intermittent source, you've got to have a megawatt of what are called spinning reserves, which means you're burning coal or natural gas or something like that, or current generation nuclear, 
so that if this goes down because the wind quits blowing or the sun goes behind a cloud or the, the panels are hit, the sun's hit by a cloud, this comes online like that. And so that's, you know, so you've got two costs embedded in your electricity rates today. You've got traditional and renewable. And what I'd like to do is just go past all that stuff and go to something that, that's it's always on and zero emissions. I have like a gazillion more questions, but I saw a stop sign from the corner over there and I must oh, obey. Shoot, I was getting started. <laughs> we want to thank you so very much. We have a, a lovely piece of bling for your wall. Oh, thank you. Uh, and an appreciation place. for sharing your insights on trade and energy policy. So, thank well, you I hope so it was fun. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you'll join us again for some of our upcoming Mossbacher Institute events. Uh, we have Ann Kruger, uh, former chief economist at the World Bank and the I, uh, deputy director at the uh, International Monetary Fund, will be coming to speak on February the 13th. And Jaime Sarapuche will be our headliner uh, for an event uh, two weeks later on February the 27th. Okay, as uh, Dr. Sarapuche was Mexico's leading negotiator for NAFTA. So we think that these will be wonderful events and we look forward to hosting you at that time. So thank you all for coming. Can I interrupt for a minute? Please do. You're not going to be here for any of those things. Let's give Lori a hand for all of them.